Okay. Thank you. You don't need any introduction. I don't need no any introduction. <laughs> okay, that's a very good introduction. Okay, so let, uh, what's going on? Leave the meeting. It's been recorded. Okay. Okay, so as we all know, uh, if you look at comp compound system, what you see depends on your resolution. The Rutherford scatter alpha particles is all the nucleus at all. It's no idea what's inside and how it's built. If you increase the resolution, for example, go with few hundred MeV electrons, you can see that the nucleus is made of nucleons. And you further increase the resolution, you can see that the nucleons in the nucleus are made of particles, which are gluons and quarks. And, uh, and on Monday, on the first day, we discussed the nucleus in the resolution that it made out of nucleons. And so how beautifully we can describe the system without taking into account uh, the fact of what's going on inside the nucleons. Uh, so essentially, the nucleus is a bound system, a very weakly bound. I mean, the binding is only kind of 1% of the mass uh, <coughs> in this picture. Uh, yesterday, we started, and uh, Tuesday and Friday, we're going to discuss the, 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 the inside structure of the nucleon. And with a better resolution, we can see that the nucleon is made out of quark and gluons and, and see all the complexity. And all these are confined by the strong interaction field, which is at the order of one GeV. So the binding energy in the nucleus is something like 10 MeV. And the confinement of the quarks and the gluon in the nu nucleon is something like the order of GeV. So we have a few order of magnitude different between these two phenomena. And you might ask yourself if we are living in two different worlds. I mean, can we live here and do the raw energy nuclear physics that we had on Monday? And can we live here and do whatever we do without taking care or worry about the fact that this nucleon is either in the nucleus or free? And the answer, and, and the trivial answer would be, why not? I mean, why should? all this structure care about the fact that the nucleon is either bound or not bound by can anything. But we know for, for quite a long time that that is not the story. And the, the experimental, the best experimental uh, point into this is called the EMC effect. What you can see here, F2 is the structure function. Structure function is some function that describes the movement of the particles inside the nucleus. We'll get to more detail on it. <coughs> and you can see here the structure function per nucleon in a heavy nucleus like lead compared to the neutron. And the important thing is that the structure function of the nucleus is not Z times the structure function of the proton plus N times the structure function of the neutron. If it would be, it would go along this line of one. It's clearly not one. So we have all kinds of depletions and uh, anti-shadowing and so on. And all this is called the EMC effect. I'm going to concentrate on this region between x equal 0.3 and let's say 0.8. This is the region where the valence quark are the dominant contribution <coughs> of the nucleon. And you can see a big depletion of, of, the, of, of the F2, which means that the momentum distribution of the valence quark in a bound nucleon is different from that of a free. And, and, and this, this, was made, this measurement was done on many nuclei with many probes. And this is solid experimental result. The question is the interpretation, but there is, the experimental result is solid. Uh, so, 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 uh, if you want to describe what happened inside the nucleon, uh, we have to take into account all the quarks and the C quark and so on and so on. And we have all kind of uh, functions that describe their distribution and so on. And uh, if we drink enough, we see them, but actually we have to drink enough to see them double because all this quantity in the nucleus are going to be different from free quantities. So all this complexity is, is at least double in some sense. Okay, so, so, so let me 
stop for a moment of this, I'll get, I'll get back to it and tell you about what we call the nuclear short range correlation. It's a question of terminology, so I have to define what I call. It's not necessarily going to be the way everyone called these things, but the neutrons are moving in the nuclear. And from time to time, two neutrons get close to each other. They cannot get very close to each other because the nuclear nuclear force is repulsive when the distance between the center of the neutrons is small enough. <laughs> but let's say the two neutrons get close to each other in such a way that the distance between them is at the order of the radius. So there is a very strong overlap between these uh, two nuclons, and I would like to call this two nucleon short correlation. And apparently, about 20% of the nucleon in at, at the nucleons at any time in the nuclei are in such good condition. They are moving, and 20% of them each time are close to each other. But let me redefine this uh, in, a, in, in a better way for, for me uh, to. As experimentalists, I'm, I'm going to go to momentum space. When the two neutrons are close together, the relative momentum is high. So I'm going to look in the ground state of the nucleus for two neutrons. Each one of them have momentum which is substantially above the average momentum of neutron in nuclear, above the Fermi C level. And the two momenta, the two big momenta, are balancing each other roughly. So we're talking about a pair of neutrons. It's a very relative large momentum and a small center of mass molecule. Large, small compared to the Fermi theorem, which is the natural scale to discuss movement of nuclear in nuclear, <coughs> which is about 250 mb per C for almost all nuclei. And, uh, and what I would like to argue is that the bridge between this picture and this picture has to do with those two short range correlation nucleons. And I'll try to justify it and show you why I think this is the case. So a little bit about short range correlation. It's a big industry in the last decade or decade and a half. And, uh, and, and it has so different. They are, so they are uh, excuse me? So they just are uh, they're not permanent, right? <coughs> they're, they're, they're moving away. Yeah, they are temporal fluctuations. If you look at them as density, the normal density is all zero. From time to time, two neutrons get close to another, and they have a local density fluctuation of few times all zero, which disappear as they they they, they are temporal. It's fluctuation. It's not it's it's, it's not a constant. It's not always the two neutrons. Each time, two other neutrons, and only for a short time, which is one Fermi typically times ten. Okay, so, so it turned out that most of the nucleons in the nuclei above the momentum above the Fermi C level are in short range correlation. So this has a large impact on the many body system, the nuclear many body system, and there are many works that relate short range correlation to this. Uh, two nucleons close to each other is a good opportunity to learn about nucleon nucleon interaction. In particular, these two nucleons are dominated by tensor force. And you can see very large sensitivity to the tensor force. So there is a nuclear interaction done via the nuclear correlation. And there is a question of the nuclear structure which relate to the, to the short range correlation. <laughs> In the last years, we did study of nuclear correlation using photons, real photons, hadrons, either photon scattering or nuclei in inverse kinematics and electron scattering. But from all this map, what we are going to discuss today is the nucleon structure modification in the nuclei as studies by electrons. So it's one piece of the full cake, which I have to enforce myself during the. You say that uh, the uh, every momentum is not one Fermi. Excuse me? Uh, the Fermi momentum is not about one Fermi. The, the, Fermi, <coughs> the Fermi momentum is 250 mV per C in, in almost all nuclei. Once you got above carbon, and the length scale would associate with the the length scale that go with this is uh, one Fermi. Yeah, one ninety seven is one Fermi. Okay, so so what I'm going to do in this talk, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you what we know about short range correlation, 
and show you that anything we know about short-term correlation and impacting the, the structure, the internal part of structure of the nucleon, I'll show you that that's what happened. And via versa, anything we know about this, how it impacts this. So I want to see if I can predict from what I know here about here, and if I predict from what I know here about there. And if I can do it, it means that those are correlated strongly. So, so let's first talk about the tools. We are, we are talking about exclusive R scattering, which means we are coming with high energy probe. And we want the probe to have a wavelength, the Boli wavelength, which is shorter than the size of the target. And we want the momentum transfer to be big enough. It's essentially the same of all its optic. If you want to see a complex picture with light, you better use wavelengths which is smaller than your picture. You can see it even with bigger, but then you have interference in a very complicated system, uh, picture. A simple picture comes with a short wave, short enough wave. Well, yeah, the same happened with scatter. If I dial this, the, the numbers in this way, I can see the <coughs> internal structure of the complex system. And actually, I'm going to play the game twice. I'm going to dial the kinematics and do the scatter in such a way that I can see the internal structure of the nucleon. This is called deep inelastic scatter. And then I'm, I'm doing the same. Uh, and instead of seeing the parton structure of the nucleon, I'm going to look at the parton structure of the nucleon, the nucleonic structure of the nucleon. And again, I'm going to make sure that uh, the kinematic is such that uh, when I'm eating, if I have two nucleon short range correlation of 81, the other one is not directly seeing the probe, but you can see the correlation because of the correlation, not because you eat it together. So, so that's the game. And let's start with deep inelastic scattering. Uh, deep inelastic scattering is the most simple experimental way to approach the structure of the nucleon. You take a lepton, you scatter it. The lepton is unpolarized. The, the proton is unpolarized. And you do, the only thing you detect is the outgoing lepton. You have an electron, scatter electron, detect the electron. You cannot do less than this. And if you, if you work with the kinematics and you, you see how many degrees of freedom, minus constraint, you can see that there are only two kinematical variables. Of course, all the kinematical variables are related to each other, so you can choose whatever you want. But normally, people choose Q square, the form momentum transfer, which is the form momentum transfer of this virtual what, a photon that describes the electron scattering. This is the quantity that determines the space resolution of your probe. If you want to probe distance short enough, you want the Q square to be big enough. The bigger the Q square, the better is the resolution. The other kinematical variable that people use are called the Oken X. It's the ratio of the Q squared to twice the mass of the proton and the energy transfer. So this is kinematical variable, as defined here, and it's run between zero and one for a proton, but it also has a dynamical meaning. And the dynamical meaning is if you assume a proton model and you assume that the electron scattering is described by a single photon exchange, and the single photon is interacting with a single quark, then X is giving you the fraction of the proton momentum that this particular quark that you interact with carries. <clears throat> and now, again, if you take the most general scalar you can build, you can see that you can describe this cross section by, by two functions. Those two functions are called unpolarized structure function. And noted as F1 and F2, and those function and function of the two kinematical variable, X and Q squared. That's it. That's the most you can get out from this scatter. That's the most general information you can get out. And this F2 is the F2 that uh, we saw before. So, so if I have an electron scattering of a proton, the cross section is function of F1 and F2, Actually, F1 and F2 are proportional. So essentially, the cross section is mainly function of F2. And, uh, and, and, and what F2 tells you is about the parton distribution, momentum distribution of the parton inside the proton. What is Y? <laughs> Excuse me? What is 
What's his wife? Where did we find wife? Ah, here. <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> some some uh, ratio. But it's also can you say it in uh, can you say it loud? It's the y is in elasticity, so yeah, it tells you how much the electron loses essentially the energy. Loses energy, okay. Almost, right? Because omega is so important. Yeah, it's, it's omega over. Yeah, they're all. I mean, they're, they're two kin two free kinematical variables. Mm -hmm. You can play whatever you want. You stay. You end up with two independent. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, something is. Okay, and then you can do the same story with the nuclear. So you can extract structure function to describe partner distribution in nucleon. You can do it for nuclei, and I all, already told you the story. That, that the structure function you get from nuclei is not just the sum of the structural function of the proton and the neutron in the nucleus. <laughs> that's the EMC effect. That's the lesson of the EMC effect. Which now, what it tells us is that the momentum distribution of a bound of a partons in a bound nucleon is different to some extent from those of partons in a free photon. But the structural function of a neutron, you wouldn't get it in the same way. Right? Yeah, but uh, yeah, we'll talk about the neutron separately. But in this approximation, you assume that the neutron is just a proton in a neutron. And you assume that iron is equal number of protons and neutrons. Both of these assumptions are not so bad. Because the neutron is two Fermi apart, two, two point two MeV bound, and two Fermi apart, and the iron is almost negative. So. That, that, that this difference doesn't cause this. <laughs> and, and what I would like to argue is the reason for this is the two clones two no close together, the short range correlation. And I'll try to, to show you why, why I think so. Uh, so let's start with the data. What you, what you see here is the inelastic scattering of an iron divided by inelastic scatter of a deuteron. Each one of these cross sections is per nucleon, so it's normalized. <coughs> the data is from Slack. And you can see it's small x. You can see the EMC effect. And the strengths of the EMC effect, we are going to, if I go back, uh, the way I'm going to quantify the strengths of the EMC effect is to look at this law. It's almost a linear a line here. All, all nuclei looks the same. And the slope of this line will, will, will be my quantification of the size of the EMC effect. Bigger EMC effect, bigger slope. Smaller EMC effect, smaller slope. So, so I get the strength of the EMC effect from just fitting here to a line and getting the slope. If you look at this, same inclusive cross-section ratio at x bigger than one, x bigger than one must involve more than one nucleon because x on proton runs from zero to one. If you have more than one, except from a small Fermi motion correction, it must be more than one nucleon. So what you can see here is the contribution in the nuclei for more than one nucleon for pairs. Actually in all nuclei, <coughs> it's the same. It's the only difference how many pairs and how many pairs to quantify how many pairs, I take the level of this plateau that you measure here. And so, so this measurement was done a long time ago, and everyone knew it. And, you know, E prime scattering is the most fundamental or simple. Okay. So I, I always have these questions. So when X above one in nucleus, um, and it must involve more than one nucleus. Yeah. So what's the fundamental picture? Is that still scatter off a quark, or is it scatter off a blob of objects together? Or? Uh, we, we have to discuss it. It's, it's, it's a big question. To some extent, is not exactly like scattering of two neutrons, because otherwise there wouldn't be the EMC effect. Right. But let, let me, sure. that's, that's the, that's the, okay. It's more like the, the end of the story. <laughs> you can just, from the experiment, you can just say that it's X. So in the interpretation of X. X, X is a measure. What you see here is all measure. 
all so measurements. Uh, We're it. talking about the interpretation, yeah. and he's talking about high level interpretation, so we wait. <laughs> if you look at this, your formula for x, just go back to that formula. And it's q squared over 2 mw. Yeah. Q squared over, yeah. So q squared over 2 mw. So the q squared becomes larger. Yeah. So the momentum is being transferred to two part arms in your picture. Yeah, if the m simultaneously. Yeah, if, if the m they're together. Yeah, if the m would be if if I put two m, yeah. it will be small. But since I put one m, it's becoming more than one. Understood. But that means that you can also in that scenario. It's interesting that you asked this question. I never thought about. So you could never have a three-part system on which this. I mean, it's not intuitive. I, 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 I understand. I guess we are asking about this question further. Scatter. So you never seen. So you, we have never. There's no tendency to plot this beyond two. Is that correct? Yeah, you can see beyond two, and then you can. So that's then you a way to look for more than two. Yeah. yeah. Then you have but, three parts. Yes. <laughs> not three nucleons. Three nucleons. Yes. And not necessarily three quarts, it could be one quart that's carrying all the momentum for two nucleons, or most of the momentum for three nucleons. That's another possibility. I didn't know it was a single proton. You could also have two point exchange, right? Uh, but yeah, but that's small correction. Cross section is two. Yeah, it's small correction. Very it's a fine, fine correction for many, much more precise work than what I'm telling you here. And you I'm doing you? physics of 10%. You see the two nucleons, nucleons, so you know there's two in the final state, or excuse me, do you, do you observe the two nucleons again? You can, you can, okay. yeah, some sometimes for the E prime, not, but you can do you, we, we did observe them, okay? So let's say, uh, so, so, so this is this is this is this is this is the you know, this is the data, but then let's look at it in this way, well, you can see here is the size of the EMC effect, the slope that we measure at small x, versus the number of pairs that you, you identify, which is the level of how much you, the plateau is above x bigger than one. And you can see a beautiful over the periodic table correlation between these two quantities, between the size of the EMC effect and the amount of short range correlation pairs. Now we know the short range correlation pairs are high momentum. Wait, wait, wait. How did you quantify the short range correlation pairs? By all nuclei, we'll get to it, but all nuclei have the same high momentum tail above the Fermi C level. Okay. And the difference between one nucleus and another is only a scaling factor which tells you how many pairs you have. And this is the scaling factor. But that's where model dependence comes in because the momentum distribution changes if you change your nuclear. Yeah, but uh, whatever it is, it's the same for all nuclear. You take, you take AV18, for example, and you calculate all nuclear, you can calculate, you look above 250 and maybe you see all the momentum distribution. Is. But is that true if you use a very soft interaction and not something? That's the really, that's really strong depend. The, the shape will depend on the interaction, the scaling. Of it. As the ratios. Yeah, the ratios stay the same. And I'll get to it because this is important. And it's going to say something about the EMC effect if it's related to the short range, but get to it. Yes. In J2, also the height of the plateau on the last slide. Yes. On the previous slide. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay, so so we know the short range correlation associated with high momentum nucleon. So the natural assumption would be that EMC somehow. Is mainly associated with high momentum nucleon and the nucleon. It's nucleons above the Fermi C level. So, so that's that's the assumption. I want to, to show you if how much the data support or doesn't support this assumption. So we assume that this correlation means that both phenomena are strongly associate with moment with nucleon, with this high momentum nucleon, with this pairs with this high density fluctuations that happen in the nucleus. That's what caused the EMC. That's what make, so the general picture is nucleon and nuclei are not different from free nucleus. They have the same power distribution as free nucleus. But from time to time, they get close to each other. When they get close to each other, their power distribution is being modified and is different from just the power distribution of two nucleons separate. And that's what caused the EMC effect. That's the general idea. Now I want to support it or show you what the data say about this assumption. 
Okay, the, the idea is clear. Okay, so let, let's so let's continue. Last, last question. Can I ask a question? <clears throat> so so uh, what that also shows that the larger the nucleus, larger the K, K1, K2 of the two particles, the two nucleus. Is no, the K1, K2 are roughly the same. The, the larger the nucleon, the more pairs you have. But the more pairs. You have. Yes. And you, you, you know, the Fermi C yeah, level right. of, okay. of carbon okay. and is the same. Yeah, okay. I mean, okay. if you don't make your life and the difference between them, it does the so same. It makes sense to have large nucleus have more chance of having these. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but the two nucleons are almost the same in all nuclei. And that's because the nucleon nuclear interaction is strongly density dependent and very strongly distance dependent. So the two nucleons are close to each other. They mainly feel each other and don't care if they are neutron or there is a lead around them. That's, that's what determines essentially the momentum distribution, the fact that they are close and how close they are and what quantum number they have and so on. So, I have a question. Um, the, the Q square value uh, you talk about is a uh, uh, few 1 GeV, 2 GeV ish, right? What is, the op what is the optimal Q square range you could use to probe this? I, you know, I, my, my question is like, if you have very low Q square, then this probably, I assume you will not be able to probe it, right? So yeah. what, what is, the, what is the, the, the range of Q square one can use yeah, to what probe we, What we know, from electron scattering is that things start scaling and behaving Q square independent, roughly above Q square of one and a half to GV. Okay. Well, Can you measure so, well, We actually are launching now a program to see how much down you can go, because of course you can gain much if you go down because they have more weight and so on. But so far, all the data that we are doing is Q square above one and a half at least. Okay, what happens if you go to very large Q square? Would would you still you lose the sensitivity uh, no, because no, no, you go to a low no. X region or what, can you go high, large Q square? To the to the largest Q square we did the measurement, which is between one and a half and what five or something like this. Uh, we don't see any Q square dependence. Oh, okay, so you can do this uh, in the in the EIC. Basically, there's no problem. You go to large. Yeah, Q -square. They, yeah this higher Q square, we have to to see what's happening. Okay, thanks. Okay, so, so, oh, so. Uh, you're comparing uh, more simply the system of two nucleons to the system of many nucleons. Yes. What about three nucleons? Three nucleons? Would that be the same as a nucleus or is it it's, it's essentially similar, but not exact. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll show it. Yeah, that's right. There's the, the few system body system like helium-3 and helium-4. Yeah, and yeah. Yeah, three body force are very important. Yeah, let me try to, to get to it. Uh, it's the next level of communication again. Okay, so 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 again, the same picture. And now I want to tell you what I know about short range correlation and see how it impacts what we know about parton. A parton distribution of, nucle of inside nucleus nucleon in the nucleus. <clears throat> so short range correlation, what do we know? If you look at nuclei in momentum space, below the Fermi C level, you have a great description of the nucleus with nucleon sitting in, in levels and in some kind of a mean field that produced by their interaction. And you can think about free, uh, single nucleon sitting in this and feeling all this, but this is covering roughly 80% of the nucleons and about 20% any time a momentum above the Fermi momentum, the Fermi C level. And what's interesting is the following, all the momentum distribution, either calculated with realistic nuclear nuclear ab initio calculation or measure, measure, it means, not the, they're all the same for all nucleons. They have the same shape. The only difference between them is the scaling, which if you assume it's dominated by two nucleons, then it means that the only difference between nucleus A and nucleus B is how many pairs. We also know that most of the pairs here are NP pairs rather than PP or an NN pair. And we understand the reason. The reason is the nuclear nucleon force. The nucleon nucleon force that correspond to the distance, typical distance between these two nucleons, 
is tensor. The, the, the scalar part, the most important part of the nuclear nuclear force, at normal distance of nuclear and nuclear is attractive. At short distance, it's repulsive. In between, it must go through zero. When this big, normally big scalar part of the nuclear nuclear interaction goes to zero, the next piece which take over is the tensor. And that's the one that dominate the two nucleus. And the tensor force like the spins to be parallel. And from a Fermi, generalized Fermi uh, consideration, you want the wave function to be uh, asymmetric, then you can make the proton neutron spin one uh, with a symmetric uh, space wave function nicely, but you cannot make it with two neutrons or two protons. And therefore, most of the pairs are empty pairs. <coughs> and, uh, and, and, and they create the same high momentum tail. So if I take, if I call above the Fermi, Fermi C level, the short range domina, domain of the nucleus, then we know about two things. We know about N, NP, NP short range dominance coming from the tensor force, meaning most of the pairs are empty pair. And we know about universality. Universality means that the momentum distribution is the same except for a factor. Now, I would like to show you that those effects are going to show, they impact the pattern distribution. And they should if the two of phenomena are correlated. Uh, but before I do this, I want to, to discuss a few other things in the short range correlation. <laughs> And one of them has to do with asymmetric nucleus. Let's assume we have neutron rich nuclei. We have many more neutrons than protons, lead, for example, 50% more neutrons than protons. In the high momentum tail, we say we have equal number of protons and neutrons. That means that in asymmetric nucleus, the probability of a proton to be above the Fermi C level is bigger than the probability of the neutron because you have equal number of proton and neutron above the Fermi C level, but many more neutrons than proton. So <laughs> this comes from the science paper. So if you try to describe it as a party, let's assume we have a party with boys and girls, and let's assume that the dancing is done only between boy and a girl, very conservative. Uh, and then let's assume that we have more girls than boys. The result is going to be that a boy is going to dance more than a girl because girls wouldn't find partner to dance with. Moreover, if I take this unbalanced party and I'll add more girls to it, the results will be that the probability for a girl to dance will be even smaller. And the probability by adding neutron, the probability for a pro, for, by adding girls, the probability for a boy to dance will be bigger because it has a bigger chance to find a match. Same happen in nuclear. Uh, in, asymmetric nu in, in asymmetric nucleus, <coughs> what's going on? Okay, same happen in nucleus. If you have asymmetric nucleus more not on the proton, if I look, Below the Fermi C level, the cross section to scatter of a neutron divided by elementary cross section to, to scatter of a neutron, which is basic. This, this is basically the ratio of neutron to protons measured. If you lo look below the Fermi C level, the ratio of neutron to protons is roughly n over z. If you look above the Fermi C level, it's one. In lead, you have 50% more neutrons, same number of neutron and proton above the Fermi C level of lead. And if you look at, if you add more nucleons, for example, you look at the ratio of the probability of a proton to be here versus here and a neutron to be here versus here, then, <coughs> then you increase the nucleons and put more proton and neutron, the neutrons are saturated. They cannot find more partners. So they don't get more above the Fermi C level and they don't get more pairs produced, but the number of protons increase. Uh, and, and all this we actually formalize in what we call generalized nuclear contact formalism. That's the reference, which I'm not going to go into. I just want to take the message. Those are nuclear physics properties. They're extracted from nuclear. And now I want, 
at some point soon I'm going to show you what they do to the parton distribution inside the nucleon inside the nucleus. Okay, so the same story again. We are going now to go from here to here. Take all the properties we say here and see how the impact I'm showing myself. I'm going to go from here to here. I'm going to take all the property that we discuss here and show how the impact is now. Okay, so one, one, one big, one big, very different understanding of the EMC effect or any other way to explain it before is to understand that the EMC effect is kind of a, let's call it small effect. It's a 15, 20% effect. Now, if all the nucleon in the nuclei are modified, they are roughly modified by this amount, let's say 15%. However, if most of the EMC effect come from the I-momentum nucleons, and the I-momentum nucleons above the Fermi C level are only 20% of the nucleon, then the modification of this one-fifth of the nucleon is five times bigger. So we are talking about large modification of a small number of nucleons. And the notification we are talking are going to be 50 to 100%, not 5 to 15%, if this story is true. Okay, so this is one, one consequence if you want to associate these two. Uh, let's talk about other things. We say that short range are universal, means if the short range and the EMC coming from the same source, the EMC effect should be universal. This means that I should be able to find a single modification function that describes the EMC effect in all nuclei. I don't have to adjust the modification for each nucleus according to its nuclear structure. If this story is true. <coughs> and there's some consequence about the Dutron, which I'll say later. And, uh, and uh, MP dominance, we say that what it means in neutron rich nuclei is, is that the proton, we have more short range protons, the probability for proton to be above the Fermi C level is bigger, therefore the EMC effect for the proton should be bigger than for the neutrons. Sorry, so, so guys, sorry, so, so the universality is your is your assumption or is it no, consequence the, or the universality or is a measurement for short range coverage. If I assume that the EMC effect has the same, re, same reason as the short range or mainly dominated by short range, the universality is my prediction for the EMC. So okay, that's so the nuclear so physics prediction for the particle physics distribution, distribution of particle nuclei. Right, but you assume the SRC universality. That's I know, I measure. I measure all nuclei. I saw that all the high momentum, I calculate or measure whatever you want. All the high momentum tails in all nuclei are the same. From neutron to left. I can show you AB18 calculation, I can show you data. They're all on top of each other. So this I measure. Universality for short range I measure. And this I'm trying to, to predict if the two are associated with the same nucleus. And I'll show you how well this prediction works. So is the short range universality have some, something to do with the, <clears throat> the binding energy per nucleon is sort of universal? I think the, the short range, they are connected, everything is connected. I think the main reason for the universality of the short range is the fact that the two nucleon, the interaction, the other inter, the how the interaction, the strong interaction between the two nucleons is dominated when the two nucleons are close to each other and much, and the effect of all the others is small. That's what makes the universality. So in any nucleus, eventually what you have is two nucleons close to each other. The fact that they are close enough is this quantum numbers tell you what's the momentum distribution of them. And in different nuclei, the only difference is how many pairs you have. That's the reason for the universality. It also induced some universality to the binding energy and so on. I think there's, there's this 
Chen Detmol, the Detmol of Chen architecture to explain to other of the office, but there's an EFT operator program expansion is yes. for this unit facility. It's uh, looking at later. But, but there's I, a paper that explains this. And, and, and can I say there's also a paper like 1983 paper trophy and yes. which, which combines the binding and definitely the there are many theoretical papers. Yeah, yeah. The reason why I emphasize this because I think that once we have a data, the data is taken over. Yeah. All the great theoretical collaboration, great, but if you see it in the data, then the result is shown. You take the momentum distribution, you take uh, the x distribution of the nuclei, you divide them, you go x above one, you see plateau on the ratio. Uh, usually in big nuclei, we see much less of the mass tensor forces. They're basically gone. So, how is this? Uh, Again, in a big nucleus, what happened? We don't see much of tensor forces. Ah, you don't see in a nucleus, you don't see. Because, in a big nucleus. Yes, because the, the, the dominant nuclear force in nuclear physics is scale. But yeah. in the fluctuation, the tensor is taken over. Like 20%. So you say it's only, it's only on this. When the nucleons are sitting in the, in, 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 the, in, the, in the global field of all the rest, scalar is, if can neglect, well, of course, you, you're not going to have deuteron and so on if you neglect it. But in general, you can neglect the, anything but the scale. But once they get close to each other, the scalar part is becoming zero, and then the tensor is. So only for this 20% temporary pairs, the tensor is a problem. That, that, that is not, not a non-independent statement. There is, so you can have a deuteron without a tensor force. No problem, <coughs> EFT does that all the time. Um, and you can change your potential and the statement you just made, it would go away, right? You can remove this correlation on the deuteron wave function and all of that. Cool. But you have to make a, make a choice of what to say is the underlying human interaction to make all of these statements. Yeah. But the observations, they can be interpreted in different ways. In principle, yes, but this is the straightforward, simple explanation. It works. It, it is a, of it course, is, of course, is, things which are not observable, you can explain this many, many right. different ways. You can get the operator expansion and, and get many body physics into it and so on. But eventually, under these particular conditions that we are working, all this uh, many body expansion are collapsing to, to exactly this story. Well, I mean, the, what you measure is what you measure, but there's multiple equivalent ways of describing it you in can theory. It. That's, that's why all I'm saying is when you say a statement that is so and so, that it's always under certain assumptions yeah. you can make that explanation. Yes, just like that's, that's my simplest straightforward explanation. Yeah, that's, that's Anything I'm saying or something which is not observable is my private opinion. Observable is measured. I have to distinguish between the two. Right, but that's on the theory. Right? <laughs> yes. well, theory or not, but right? what you measure, you measure. The, all the rest are in principle open to different experiments. Well, it's, I mean, it's not that easy, right? You measure cross sections and count rates, and then you extract from that, and you say you measured that quantity, but somewhere along the way, when you go from the actual thing in your detector to the thing you're presenting at the end, you might have made yeah. assumptions, and those are important to spell out. Okay, but let's move on. Uh, all this uh, we can discuss in the afternoon. They're all important things and so on, but I want to get this general picture first. And you can ask a tiny question. Yes. So is the tensor, is that an observable or not an observable, the tensor interaction? The, 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 your face sheets for the nuclear yeah. yes, it's observable. Yeah. It's observable. Okay, so, 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 so let me show you this. This is a nature from a few years ago. You can, what you can see here is the strength, the many, how many pairs you get per proton, uh, for different nuclei. So you go along this line, you add more protons, and you have more pairs. You also, the strength of the EMC effect gets bigger. However, if you do the same for neutrons, you go all the way from carbon to lead, the number of pairs doesn't change. The number of, pair, the number of pairs per nucleon doesn't change. The probability 
for creating pair doesn't change. The neutrons are saturated. They cannot find partner to do more pairs. Interesting enough, the EMC effect is also saturated. The EMC effect strains from carbon to lead almost doesn't change per neutron. It does change per proton. So you see the same story that we saw, the NP dominance from the short range correlation show up in the sense in the size of the EMC effect. Let's continue. And let's talk about universality. So let me take the simplest wrong, but simplest way to think about things. Let's assume that we have 80% of the nucleon below the Fermi C level. Those are standard nucleons. They're sitting in shells, the epi, the moving, they're not sitting, they're moving. And the internal particle distribution is the same as those of free and, 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 and proton and neutron. And I put all the modification that cause the EMC effect only on this piece. So I take the F2 and split it to Z time normal protons plus N times normal neutrons plus the number of pairs with a modification that is only on those pairs. Okay, so th this is extreme. It's probably the, the, the life are not so extreme, but <coughs> let's take this assumption and see how, how we can go. If this is the case, then the pieces which is modified should be universal. It should be the same for all nuclei. So you can see here, this is the F2, this is the standard EMC effect for different nuclei. All these colors are different nuclei, all the way from EM3 to lead. And this, if you extract this piece that's supposed to be universal, you see how nicely they collapse to the same. And actually I can do, I can do, I can quantify this. I can take this ratio, all these things are measured and I can extract the modification and I can extract a, a unified fun, a, a one, a, one universal function that you can see here. And this is supposed to describe all the EMC effect for all nuclei. So let me briefly show you how well it does. So this is, this is, those are different uh, carbon measurement and different uh, accelerators and different kinematics. Those are different nuclei. The lines are always the same function. So you can see helium four, you can see lead, all consistent with one modification. That's what you expect if the EMC is dominated by this high momentum nucleons, which are normally, which are short range correlated pairs. Okay, uh, and let, let me show you something else. In the EMC effect, what you do is di this, di divide the nucleus by the deuteron, assuming the deuteron is free. Is a free proton and neutron, but it's not. If you look at this universal behavior, the deuteron is here and an NP free pair is here. And the difference between deuteron and free NP is almost as big as the difference between in three and deuteron. <coughs> now, this is important, one second, because the deuteron is served as effective neutrons for many many measurements. If you want to measure uh, G E of the neutron, you measure it of the deuteron, you subtract the proton. I'm simplified, but that's what you do. And if you want to measure the pattern distribution for the neutron, neutron is essentially consider up to corrections the, the neutron after subtracting the proton, which everyone knows. <coughs> but it's, but how, how, well, how well you can do it, you can see it here. You can see it here. This is F2N F over F2P, the structure function of the neutron and the proton, extracted from the deuteron and the proton measure. And, and, and those are calculations that reflect the uncertainty in the deuteron nuclear physics if you want to do it. And you can see it essentially, if you want to really be, uh, see at large X, for example, 
the ratio of the n to p or u to d, but correctly, there, there's huge uncertainty due to the nuclear physics. And this is the data. This is the bonus data that measure up to you. But, but what we did is, is the following. We say, you know, if there is a universal function and the universal function takes the deuteron as well as any other nucleus, let's take the information, the universal function, which is taking the information from all nuclei in the world and use this to correct and not only the deuteron. If you do this, you make the uncertainty much smaller and you get the blue band. The blue band is our prediction for Fn over Fp using the same data, but assuming, <coughs> assuming that the correction is done based on the universality of the EMC effect. So this function that we extract from all the nuclei. So smaller uncertainty does mean that you are right. But this is new data. This is published in 2022. This is the Marathon data from Jefferson Lab. This is the new data. Our prediction was before the data was published. And this, 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 this reflect, this, this is a pattern distribution. This is nuclear physics. <clears throat> okay. So let me now go to the other way. Let me go to what we know about Parton distribution and try to see if I can get information about nuclear physics. Under the assumption that these two are called that the EMC effect and the short range correlation and mainly the fluctuation of the high momentum nucleon above the Fermi C level. Yes. That D, you said the doodle, is that a data point or not? No, that's a uh, no error bar. I, I never put data point without error bar. Two things I teach my students to start this. Put units on the axis and put the bars on the deck. Then, then you can do whatever you want. <laughs> okay, so, so, so now I want to go the other way around. I want to go from here and see what I can tell you about that. Now, uh, the NC tech is a collaboration, the extract. The part of the part of distribution from nuclei. We heard about it yesterday a lot. And uh, the way you, the, what they do is they take all the deep inelastic data, all the Drelian data, and the WZ production, <coughs> and and they assume that in the nucleus the F2 is being modified, and they allow the parameter for each nucleus to be modified according to the data and they extract the pattern distribution, the nuclear pattern distributions. That's the standard, that's the way they did it all the time. We came to them and say, you know, we think that the story I told you so far is, is what happened. Let's try to see if you assume that the modification is not on all the nucleons, but only on pairs. But you assume that the modification is universal. So you have only one set of parameters that describe the modification in all of the nuclei. Then let's see how well we are doing. So this is going to, this wasn't sent for publication yet, but, but the, the last line is that the quality of being able to describe all the data, which include deep and elastic, very young, and this WNZ production is not very different between these two assumptions. So you can, in principle, describe everything. How well you can describe, let, let me flip a little bit of data. <laughs> you see, this is uh, the really young data, and those are the calculation under the short range uh, motivate assumption that you have only pairs, small number of pairs that are being modified. And, and this is uh, uh, the W production. And you see, this is a deep analysis scattering in very small X that we don't have anything to say. We didn't put anything related to it, but it's nicely fit. And, 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 and the punch point is the following. You can now 
look at the number of short range pairs, this function of the nuclei, and we have the nuclear measurements, which are in red, and we have, the, sorry, we have the nuclear measurement, which are in blue, we have nuclear calculation based on AV18, and, and you can see the pattern extraction from this fitting, and you can see that there is a nice agreement. This is prediction for the number of pairs based on pattern information. Now that's going the other way around. It's not there. <clears throat> so what, what it does, now if you, in this you can see, what, what it does, this, this, this is the ratio of F2 per nucleon in nuclei to free F2, when you assume that all the nucleons are modified, the standard assumption. And this is when you assume that it's only the pairs, and as you can see, the effect is much bigger when you assume that only the pairs are the ones that contribute. So why the why the short range nucleon pairs influence the low X region? Again, yeah. why the short range? Yeah, why the short range pairs uh, uh, influence the low X region? Because uh, I think because of uh, some because. All, all this fitting is constrained that they have to go together. So if you enforce it larger, to some extent, you might apparently also must do something on the logs. Right, but uh, right. but you, can right. you have a some normalization and so on? Yeah, yeah. That's my understanding. That's, yeah, but uh, but you could own, uh, well maybe it's the function of form you used in in the fit because uh, the concept the the the, the sum rule you could just uh, apply between the EMC region and the large X region, right? You don't have to involve the low X region. Yeah. You can make it compensate each other. Yeah, but, the, but at some point you have to, you have to match all of them. I mean, all the sums should, should sum together. So then there must be internal constraints in the fit that enforce it to be. I, I'm not, I don't know exactly what they are. Okay, okay. But are there experimental evidence uh, that, uh, yeah, that uh, short range correlation influenced the low X region? Uh, like direct experimental evidence? I, I, think, I think, I love that curve. I think there's something physical there. And it might come tomorrow, I'll, I'll give it. The problem is all the nice curves are not really measurements. No? I mean, once it's nice, it's not a measurement. <laughs> it's really, very, very, oh, show, show very clear what happened, but that's an assumption. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for blue ones, for, for low X, right? I mean, this is actually what we want to do in EIC. Mm -hmm. answer it kind of it's some, are, some are constrained by, by the, it's not independent. You cannot do low X, whatever you want, without matching the sum of the values. But Cole, when you say that, you're, you're, you're implying that the blue ones are responsible for this effect, which is, it might be true, but it might not. Well, first of all, we don't know if this effect happens. Yes. Well, but I thought you were saying, I thought your statement just said that if it's if blue are responsible for this, then they will show up at the EIC, the lower region. I think what I'm saying is we have identified experimental way to find out if this has any correlation with the short range correlation. Can you distinguish between blue ones versus quotes? Yeah, J side, couple with blue ones. Very good. Mm -hmm. Some threshold J sub will make you will, will put you the short range and the gluon yeah. together. Sure. For sub the, the short range will give you the momentum you need to do sub threshold production, and the J side will tell you that you're looking at the gluon. So essentially, if you want to focus on this, the J sub threshold J sub production will, will match the gluon and the short range. But you can also do it high And there's paper by Others that suggest this. Okay, so so the right things the right thing to do is to measure always if you fail. And, and and the way to study this is to go to the simplest system you can think of neutron and do a deep inelastic scattering of a proton and tag it with high momentum neutron. Or do deep inelastic scattering on a neutron and tag with high momentum proton and see. If this deep elastic scattering is different from, from the free one. And that's exactly going to be discussed tomorrow by Taylor. So I'm not going to take the, the, the fun from, from, from his talk, 
But the last line is that our preliminary, we did publish it, we're getting close, I hope to publish it. The effect is large. We see an F2 modification, which is the order of 50%, not five or 10%. That's what you expect if really uh, <laughs> the, 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 the short, the high momentum, high virtuality pairs are the one that contribute to the to the uh, to the EMC effect predominantly. So I'm going to skip all this and let Taylor do it right and let me summarize. Uh, from the nuclear point of view, if you look at nucleus in momentum space below K Fermi, those are kind of nucleons within an infield, filling states, and, 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 and all the predictions are great for excitation energies and binding energy and, and, and removal energies and so on. Above the Fermi C level, you can find about 15 or 20% of the nucleon in each time. <laughs> they are mainly NP pairs <laughs> due to the tensor force that dominate these two. And they create a momentum tail, which has the same shape from Deuteron to Lenin. And the scale is how many pairs you have. So you have uh, the consequence is that you have equal number of protons and neutrons above the Fermi C level, even if you have many more neutrons in the nucleus. Uh, <coughs> and uh, okay, essentially that's what we say. And then if I go to the part of the EMC effect, the part and part of the game, to a large extent, these statements are either, of course, too sharp and obviously not absolutely right. But essentially, what we think is the large fraction of the EMC effect come from those two short distance high density fluctuation in the nucleus. Normally, nucleons are normal in nuclei, except for short period when they are close to each other, and somehow this close proximity changed their part of distribution. Uh, and and uh, I show you uh, I show you the the anti dominance uh, that's common to both. I show you the universality that common to both. I show you the ability to predict the neutron and. Uh, Taylor is going to explain this, but you can see there's a huge effect, large effect. Uh, if you look at the modification in the right kinematics, the story will be told tomorrow. And, uh, and, and the way to do it is to modify those small nucleons more substantially, like this, for example, and to get the EMC effect. And it, it's also as a prediction in it that need to be measured is that the EMC effect is predominantly associated with proton in asymmetric nuclei rather than neutrons. Okay, so let me thank the organizer for the invitation, my collaborators, my senior collaborators, all the young guys that really did the work and, uh, of the, and uh, all the theoretical people that are working, the guys in blue are here in Seattle. So they know more than I on some of the stuff I talked about. Okay, I think the, it's in the time. Really. Are there other comments? Oh, can you? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> uh, thank you for the very, very <laughs> interesting talk. So I have two questions. The first one is that, do you think the short range correlation influence the equation, the nuclear equation of state? Let's say you talk about the you know, dense, dense medium and you have a short range correlation, will they change the symmetry energy equation state and uh, also the symmetric uh, uh, equation of state? Well, I think the, the following, uh, the best description of neutral star is actually that the neutron stars is maybe something like 95% neutrons and something like 5% protons. 
You need the protons because you need the electrons, you need the electrons to balance the pressure, and you need the protons to balance the charge. So a neutron star is some small component at the order of five to ten percent, people think, of protons. Now I think the connection to the short range correlation is the following. We 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 saw that the interaction between proton and neutron. Uh, create short range correlation more than between neutron and neutron. I think that the consequence is that the protons in the neutron stars, because of physics similar to short range correlation, are going to be more energetic than if you assume Fermi C levels. I mean, the 95 to 5 percent. It's translated to Fermi C levels, you can get uh, the momentum distribution within a Fermi C assumption for neutron and a proton. Real life will be that the proton are going to have more energy than this. And the consequence might be on different things like uh, cooling of the neutron stars and other things. So that's my end breaking. I, I really think that there is a connection between the two. Uh, I definitely think the connection between neutron correlation, someone asked here, and neutron stars. I think that <coughs> you probably will find very hard to create the neutron stars with mass close to two times the mass of the sun if you don't use Srinokron forces. So they may be small in nuclei, but then systems like neutron stars are important. So I think that all these physics, the heavy ions, the short range correlation and the neutron stars and the nuclear nuclear interaction, they're all part of the same story. And since this is a complex story, the only way to beat it is to go from all directions and try to get a consistent picture. That's my okay. question. Okay. So, uh, another one, thanks. Another one is that uh, we also have this alpha clustering, right, in the light nuclei. With alpha clustering also. Uh, you know, influenced uh, or being influenced by the short range correlation or reflecting the short range correlations. So you have an extra bigger than I on this. You I'm respond? not an expert on <laughs> clustering, but I, I, want, I, want, uh, I mean, intuitively, uh, if you imagine for neutrons, I think uh, all morning, all morning. <coughs> Yeah, we, the size of an alpha is much bigger than the, yeah, size the normal. Of the normal clustering we're talking are more larger range than uh, in different pieces so of the interaction. As no, I'm saying here. that if you naively imagine for nucleus getting bigger than the dark houses, there can be no even here. Just because of the spatial. Yes, but the, the cluster is much bigger than the <coughs> size of this. No, I'm just talking about alpha, single alpha. Yes. Small alpha is an alpha. Yeah, the, the alpha is very compact. It's a very, very strong compact. bomb, very compact object. Right, but but you have, you do you could have a possibility that when you have a electron scattering, you you scatter collectively with alpha cluster, right? Then you your x value will be much bigger. But uh, I just wonder if if such uh, you know you have you talk about two body uh, you know correlation, but you can have three body and maybe four body correlation. W would that be a possibility? You know, in principle, yes. But if you do the experiment with very large Q square. You're essentially probing the, the nucleus in a kind of a point like, and then you are all these effects should be there, but there's correction. There is that, the essential there. thing you do is, in fact, it's a single nucleon that mainly attached to the other nucleon, maybe also to others. It's small, but not, not, not important because it's going to be important in denser systems, it's going to be crucial for denser systems. Ellie, can I ask you? I, I want to make a comment on that. There is this 12 quark uh, helium 4 um, nuclear wave function component called the hexadi quark, which I'll talk about tomorrow. 
which is proposed to cause the E and C effect effectively be two short range correlations together. Mm -hmm. So the answer to this question is model dependent. Maybe there's a strong foreign correlation. If our model is right, it should be there, but maybe it's very small. It's yeah. Like something. Well, I think the description is model dependent. But yeah. The fact that you probably see the R correlation for more than two is probably probably seems to delay some equation of this. I think Naftali has to add some. Yeah, I, I have the, your head on the last slide or before the, before the last slide, a statement saying that the EMC effect is isospin dependent. What do you mean by that? I mean that the protons are going to be modified in neutrons in the neutron rich nuclear. Now, when you're talking about pairs, PN pairs, are they in the t equals zero state, in other words, uh, yeah, they have the quantum. Most of them have the quantum number of the group. Is what? The, most of the pairs have the quantum number of the group. So t zero spin t one. zero spin one and, and, and so on. Okay, thanks. Would you would you say it's model dependent? Slightly like model dependent state. We, no, form, no. We, we formulate it with a contact to tell you how many pairs you have, and the biggest contact is the one with the quantum number of the group. So I have a question about this. So this is probably lame, but based on the symmetry of the wave functions, I can understand so they're all empty pairs. What what allows you to have some in in or some pp pairs? Oh, are you, they're not all empty. They are, no. uh, it's 20, 20, 20 to 1 or something okay. like this. Uh, most of them are but you can have uh, you can have uh, you know PP with say equal to or you can have okay, so they're like more, more complicated so they're like a side combination yeah. PP. You can and you can also have uh, you know you can have uh, you can have uh, S, S equal one PP so okay. uh, but you compensate the asymmetry in some other case some other and I, and I guess this, yeah, I guess you can calculate it. This 20 to 1 is a measurement, or this is yeah, there's measure. a measurement of the ratio of PP to MP, oh. and it's it's a momentum dependent. Mm -hmm. When you are at the peak where the tensor force is important, the ratio is 20 to 1, and then it's approaching 4 to 1 when you increase the momentum. Mm -hmm. They're always more empty than PP yeah. because they are not one to one. A scalar will have a four to one, and, 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 and the two pairs with large momentum outside the tensor dominance are approaching this. And we have measurements. Mm -hmm. Except for A equals three, that paper that, that came out recently, yeah. A equals three nuclei are weird. They're four to one. Yeah, but those are nuclear. We're talking about nuclear nuclear force. So. No, but I'm saying the N and the yeah, the, the N P yeah. to PP pairs in yes. A plus three nuclear. Oh, yeah, the line from the in general, uh, more independent general. Right. Right. Look, uh, more governed by these large scattered that I was talking about. You can actually understand the binary difference structure in terms of this epimorphism. Right? Okay. Yeah. So it's actually not very sensitive to these of the structure of nuclear to actually can modify the logic of the same. So you're not surprised by that. Yeah, another question is that when, when you plot the, the XB dependence and you see the plot two start at 1.5 in the XB, mm -hmm. uh, what happens between one and 1.5? I mean, those also is part of your Fermi tail, right? I mean, it's part yeah, of you have, well, you, have, you, you have a you have a nucleus dependent piece which come from the fair motion, which is centered around one and go on one side to point eight, on the other side close to one point two or something like this, and then it gets better. Mm -hmm. So that twenty percent you are talking about is the everything integrate above uh, XP of about one or is the one point five? It's a, it's integration about something like three hundred millimeters C and above. It's okay. about, uh, let's say, something like 4% of the Newton wave function. And mm -hmm. sometimes more, 20% of nuclear. Okay. 
Okay. One last question. Yes. So I'm interested in that uh, neutron F2 versus proton F2, right? If you guys make a prediction and the data confirms. So what does it mean, the F2 neutron versus F2 proton? It's a U over V relation. So basically it's the- uh, Yeah, like in, in, a, in a simple Dalton model, there is a one-to-one -one equation that, uh, that F2 over F, Fn over Fp to U over V under, under the simple Dalton assumption. So, so but, but um, because there are multiple predictions, right? And then to confirm one of the predictions, correct? No, no, there, there is one measurement, but but the measurement is the measurement is is a measurement of a neutron and measurement of a proton, and and the, the prediction is how to extract the proton and the neutron ratio from those two measurements. The extraction is model dependent because it depends on the neutron nuclear physics that we don't know. We don't know the wave function of the neutron at very large moment. We don't know different things about the neutron. <laughs> that make this big difference in the prediction. Those are the uncertainty that goes to translating the measurement of the neutron in the photon to a P over N ratio or U over V ratio. It's even worse. So I'm going to talk about it, um, the, the, the neutron structure. Right? This is also motivated by this yeah. study because too many yeah. small attempts. Yeah, but that's you know that's a standard that's a standard problem in nuclear physics. I mean, if you need to go to 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 lower momentum and look at the electric form factor of the neutron, you have the same kind of problems. I mean, you don't measure directly the, the, the electric form factor or the magnetic form factor of the neutron. You only extract it from from proton, neutron, or similar thing, or even three you know, a triton or different tricks like this, and all this. As with them, uh, nuclear physics collection. If I'm not negligent. Just another question. Yes. Yeah. Uh, for the neutron rich nuclei, uh, so you were showing a picture with the. Um, I, I forgot what exactly was there. But you said the protons in the neutron rich mm -hmm. nuclei, the protons are pushed to high momentum. Mm -hmm. so, so if if I if I go let's take the extremes let's go from carbon to lead I go from carbon to lead I add proton and neutrons I have many more neutrons but uh, I add protons if 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 I, if if I look at the number of pairs or I look at the size of the EMC effect per proton that I add going from carbon to lead will show a bigger effect more pairs per proton and larger EMC effect in the lead compared to the carbon. If you do it with a neutron, it's saturated. You don't see more per, per neutron when you go from carbon to lead. It's the same. Right, right. Because oh. the extra, the, the, the extra 50% neutrons okay, don't go to above the fantasy level because they don't have partner to do it with. Does it mean that uh, in neutron rich nuclear, then the only yeah. Yeah. So you can see it. it's, it, it's beyond beyond the midfield. You can see it by it extreme. I, I can show afternoon. Mm -hmm. Get this big. I mean, you, you let's say you want let's say you want to know which one are more energetic, neutrons or protons. You have a neuton rich nuclei. You have a, a Fermi C picture. The Fermi C level of the neutron is higher than the proton. The average kinetic energy of the neutron is bigger than the proton. Okay, so, unless there is not so much difference, but there are other. It's the other way around. In lead, the kinetic energy, the average kinetic energy for neutron is smaller than for proton. And the reason is, neutron. the reason is that the high momentum, I mean, the kinetic energy goes like k, k squared over mm -hmm. 2a. So the high momentum pairs are contributing a lot to the average kinetic energy. And there are more protons in the high momentum than the neutron, and that's reverse the energy sharing. So in lead, a proton is moving with higher average kinetic energy than the neutron, <coughs> even though you have 50% more neutron than the proton. 
So it's really overcoming the mean field. So you should see more. Dramatically, it's overcoming. But you should see more of those correlations in the program sector. Yes. In the <coughs> per photon, yes. So that's something. Yes. Per photon, yes. Okay, I want to thanks again. Thank you. 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 Thank